Norwich, September 1919. Seated opposite me in the railway carriage, the elderly lady was recalling some of the murders she had committed over the years. There was the vicar in Leeds, she said, smiling, and the actress from London, of course. <laughs> that was one of my favourites, I replied. I know you, don't I? she asked, sitting forward. I work for Mr. Pinton at the Wispy Press, I told her. My name's Tristan Sadler. We met at a literary lunch. Yes, I remember now. I'm a great admirer, I added. As is Mr. Pinton. He's talked several times about trying to lure you over to our house. Yes, I know Pinton. Vile little man. I can see why he employed you there. I raised an eyebrow, confused. Benton likes to be surrounded by beautiful things, she explained. You remind me of his last assistant, the scandalous one. But I am perfectly happy with my publisher, thank you. She sat back now, her expression turning to ice, and I knew I had disgraced myself, turning what had been a pleasant exchange into a potential business transaction. I sat silent for the rest of the journey. I emerged from the great stone walls of Thorpe Station and found that the street where my lodgings were located was nearby. Upon arriving, however, I was disappointed to find that my room was not ready. Oh, dear, said Mrs. Cantwell, the landlady, trembling slightly. The room should have been ready hours ago, only... Oh, well, we had a bit of unpleasantness this morning, Mr. Sadler. That's the truth of it in your room. Or what was to be your room, that is. You probably won't want it now. I was about to ask if there was anything I could do to help, when a door behind her opened and a boy of about seventeen appeared. I told you to call me when the gentleman arrived, didn't I, Ma? He said, glaring at her. What have you told him? Well, I haven't told him anything, David. I didn't know what to say. Oh, I do apologise, Mr Sadler, he said, turning to me now. But, um, might I speak with you in private? Very well. I followed him to the far side of the hall, partly intrigued by the measure of concern on display, partly aggrieved by it. I was tired after my journey and filled with such conflicting emotions about my reasons for being in Norwich that I wanted nothing more than to be left alone with my thoughts. Look, I said, perhaps if you could just explain the problem. I did send a postal order to reserve the room. Oh, of course you did, sir, he replied. We were to put you in number four, you see. Number four is the quietest room. I read your letter, sir, and took you for an army man. Was I right, sir? I nodded curtly. I was, but not any more. Well, sir, our girl Mary is up there at the moment disinfecting everything, and it will be good as new by the time she's done with it, but, well, I believe it would be disrespectful of me not to tell you what's gone on there. I was intrigued now. A murder, perhaps? A suicide? Well, he stayed here before, Mr Charters. A very respectable chap, I always thought. Works in a bank in London. But, but there was something of a commotion early this morning. He lowered his voice. It turned out that Mr Charters went out last night, but he didn't come home alone. And we have a rule about that sort of thing, of course. I couldn't help but smile. <laughs> Is that all? Not quite all, sir, said David. For Mr Charter's companion, shall we say, was a thief. Robbed him blind, and when he protested, held a knife to his throat, and all hell broke loose. Ma woke up, I woke up, and the other guests. Well, we called the police, of course. They were both taken away. The poor man, I said. I can understand the young lady being arrested, but why on earth was he? Mr Sadler, said David calmly. I think you've misunderstood me. Mr Charter's companion was not a young lady. It was a boy. He nodded knowingly at me, and I looked away. Ah, huh. I see that. And it does leave the matter of the room, 
he said delicately. It really doesn't bother me, and I am in need of a bed. Oh, then it's settled, he said cheerfully. I followed him across to the reception counter. Would you care to sign the register, sir? I nodded and leant over the book, writing my name carefully, the ink splashing as I struggled to control my grip of the pen in my spasmodic right hand. You can wait in the drawing room if you wish, said David, staring at my trembling index finger. And once again, please accept my apologies. The world's a funny place, sir, isn't it? You never know what kind of deviance you're dealing with. My room at Mrs. Cantwell's boarding house, the infamous number four, was a bleak setting for the apparently dramatic events of the previous night. The wallpaper, a lacklustre print of drooping hyacinths, spoke of better, more cheerful times, while the carpet was threadbare. In the corner stood a wash basin with a fresh bar of soap and a clean towel. I stripped off my clothes and washed my face and body. Cleanliness. Hygiene, the marks of a good soldier. Such things came instinctively to me now. A tall mirror was positioned in the corner of the room, and I stood in front of it, examining my body with a critical eye. Scars stood out, red and livid across my legs and abdomen. I felt desperately unattractive. Once I knew I had not been so ugly. When I was a boy, people thought me pleasant to look at. Thinking of this brought Peter Wallace to my mind. Peter and I had been best friends when we were boys, and with thoughts of Peter it was but a short stroll to Sylvia Carter, whose first appearance on our street when we were both fifteen was the catalyst for my last. During that summer we went swimming together, and Peter and I attracted Sylvia's flirtatious remarks. Alone with her once, she told me that I was the best-looking boy she had ever seen, and that whenever she saw me climbing from the pool, my body sleek with water, it gave her the shivers. The remark had both excited and repelled me, and when we kissed, the thought passed through my mind that if a girl like Sylvia, who was a catch, could find me attractive, then perhaps I wasn't too bad. The idea thrilled me, but as I lay in bed at night, I imagined scenarios of the most lurid kind, none of which involved Sylvia at all. And I would swallow back my tears as I wondered what was wrong with me. What the hell was wrong with me anyway? The kiss was the only one we ever shared. For a week later, she and Peter declared they were in love. I was mad with envy and seeing the pair of them together left me in bitter twists of anguish, feeling nothing but hatred for them both. I pulled my shorts and vest on now, unwilling to sleep naked. I didn't want the sensation of Mrs. Cantwell's well-worn sheets against my body. I couldn't abide any touch that might suggest intimacy. I was twenty years old, and had already decided that that part of my life was over. How stupid of me. Twice in love and twice destroyed by it. And at the thought of that second love, I collapsed onto the floor and wrapped my arms around my knees, scrunching my eyes tightly as the terrible images returned. Why did I come here? I wondered. What was I thinking? If it was redemption I sought, there was none to be found. If it was understanding, there was no one who could offer it. If it was forgiveness, I deserved none. I awoke early the following morning, after a surprisingly undisturbed night, and I felt a little more confident about what lay ahead. Not wishing to engage in conversation, I decided against taking breakfast in the boarding house and instead crept out of the house shortly after nine. The morning was brisk and bright. I'd never been to Norwich before, and I purchased a small printed map from a street stall. My appointment was not until one o'clock, which left me ample time to see a few local sights. I crossed the bridge on Prince of Wales Road 
and continued northwards, turning through an area that identified itself by the rather morbid name of Tombland, and on towards the great spire of Norwich Cathedral. A small cafe attracted my notice, and with a reminder that I had eaten no breakfast, I decided to stop for something to eat. Waiting only a few moments in the window seat before a rosy-cheeked woman came over to take my order, I regretted not having brought a book with me, but instead I watched as the passers-by went about their business. The street was filled mostly with women doing their early morning shopping. I thought about my mother, about how she cleaned the flat every morning at this time when I was growing up. While my father took up position in the butcher's shop downstairs, carving up the fresh joints, I've been terrified of everything associated with my father's job: the bone sores, the animal carcasses, the blood-stained overalls, and my squeamishness did not endear me much to him. He hoped that I would follow him into the family business, but it never came to pass. I was expelled from home at the age of fifteen, and only returned once, more than two years later, just before I left for France. The truth is, Tristan, my father said that day as he steered me carefully out onto the street, it would be best for all of us if the Germans shoot you dead on sight. The last thing he ever said to me. When I left the cafe, I continued in the direction of the cathedral. As I stood inside the precinct walls, looking up at the magnificent monastic building, footsteps on the gravel alerted me to the approach of someone—two people, in fact. I pretended to be looking at the stained glass windows. We should be making the final list by three o'clock, the young man was saying to his older companion. Well, I'll have my say. I promise you that, the other man replied insistently. Of course, Reverend Bancroft. Came the reply, "Every one there understands your pain and grief." Nonsense! Snapped the man. They understand nothing, but I will have my say. But I need to get home quickly afterwards. My daughter has arranged something. A... Well, it's difficult to explain. She gets these notions. At that moment, the Reverend caught my eye. "Good morning, young man," he said, and I stared at him. My heart beating faster inside my chest. Good morning, he repeated, stepping towards me, smiling. Are you all right? You look as if you've seen a ghost. I opened my mouth, unsure how to reply, and then I turned on my heels and ran. How could I have been so stupid? How could I have not remembered? It was all so unexpected, though. The name, Reverend Bancroft, and then the expression on his face. The likeness was uncanny. I might have been back on the training grounds at Aldershot or the trenches of Picardy. It might have been that dreadful morning when I ascended from the holding cells in a terrible, vengeful fury.